Hey guys, what's going on? It's Jay. And in this review, I'm going to go over the Sony A7R Mark II full frame mirrorless camera. All right, guys, I'm just going to go over the features that matter really quick. Five axis steady shot is the best new feature, in my opinion, but it also has the new sensor, which is awesome with the phase detection autofocus, quite impressive. The shutter mechanism has been completely replaced by a much better module and has very little vibration, and it also offers silent shooting. So a few more key features is the internal 4K video and S-Log2 gamma profile, which basically is like equivalent to shooting raw and video kinda and then you can post process the video much more effectively with huge dynamic range gains and of course this thing has built-in Wi-Fi NFC it actually weighs in at 22 ounces 625 grams with battery and memory card and it goes for three thousand one hundred ninety eight dollars I really tested this camera out thoroughly using a variety of lenses so I just wanted to show you real quick what they looked like mounted all right, so check out this mode dial. Now it has a locking button in there, but it's not a click on, click off type thing. You have to actually press that button every time. So I don't really care for it that much. Um, it is a nice feature, but without it clicking on and off, not so much. Also check out the C2, C1 buttons and the dials for your uh, shutter and aperture and whatnot. All right, let's take a quick look at the function button and some focus modes. All right, so see here when you hit the function button, you can select your focus mode here, see that? Right now I'm on flexible spot and you can change it and you can see how some of these are grayed out and that's because I'm using a Canon lens with the Metabones adapter so you don't get all these cool features but you do still get the ones that matter you know flexible spots critical center and wide mode is what you have to use with a lens like this so I just wanted to show you that quick and that's by hitting the function button here it's basically a shortcut to all the critical settings and you can customize this to put with pretty much whatever you want in there all right, so now when using a native lens, if I go to the focus mode, I have all these options are lit up now. And this one here is lock on AF expand flexible spot. Really cool feature. And I'm going to try that out on my train. But notice how all these other features are lit up now and they were grayed out before. So anyways, now check this out. See how it's, I have the flexible spot selected over on the train. If I go back to it, you can move it around and I have it targeted right on the train. See that? So that's the target. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start the train and then I'm going to take some pictures. Alright, so here we are in Lightroom and these are the pictures from that consecutive shooting that we just did there. And you can see the hit rate's not too bad. It's pretty good. It's staying on the left hand side, whoop, there it went out. But for the most part it's tracking the train and it's using the contrast, you know, on the different uh, train cars. You know, for the most part it's doing a very good job in my opinion considering the circumstances. And I'm using the 18 to 55 millimeter kit lens. I'm really sorry I'm so sick with the stuffed nose and all, it, uh, my voice is really not the best. Alright, so clearly the video tracking worked quite well, but does it work in photography mode? Well, not really. At least in this test scene, with the train coming towards me, it's a very hard test, I understand that. But the camera was able to record video and maintain accuracy much better than it was capable of doing while taking photos. So I don't think the tracking abilities are up to snuff here. I think Sony's holding back on us because this thing was able to maintain focus tracking almost the entire time, even with the train going faster in video mode, but in photography mode it's not capable of tracking. It just doesn't make any sense to me, and it leads me to believe that Sony is holding back on us as far as the you know, photography tracking abilities go with moving subjects and whatnot. 
All right, so now check me out doing a quick human subject focus test on the deck. There's some focus tracking. I know I need a shave. I'm a disaster. I'm really sick. I'm sorry. And the website got hacked. So, you know, times are tough, guys. Give me a break. Just wanted to do a quick focus transition test here. All right, let's check out some real world video, then we'll move on to photos. Just wanted to give you a little bit of dynamic range testing here. You can see the lighting is quite harsh. Backyard's kind of messy. I'm just showing you how panning around and stuff, how this thing performs. I'm going to give you a quick walk test here. So this is me walking, trying to hold it steady. And you can see it does a pretty good job, in my opinion. Obviously not as good as a, you know, a gimbal or anything like that. But, um, I mean, this is so good compared to what you normally get without the five axis. Right, Chase? Right, buddy? Right? Oh, it's up. I have the facial recognition turned on, so it's just locking on his face right now. And if I zoom in, it maintains focus on his face. It really works well. This is in super 35 millimeter mode. Hey, buddy. Hey, Smiley. See right there, it's struggling a little bit. He's bobbing and weaving. But overall, it's really good. Hey, buddy. Hey. What, you getting frustrated? No, don't get frustrated. It's okay. Guys, plenty of other reviewers will go into the hardcore video data technical talk about the why this 35mm mode is so much better than the full frame mode. But the bottom line is, it's just reading the information off the sensor in a better way. And, um, you know, that's why it looks so much better. Alright guys, so in the lab I just wanted to show you some focusing how fast it is, all different depth ranges. And this is using the Canon lens, Canon 24 to 105 to be exact, and I'm at 70 millimeter. Just saying, now at f4, so the depth of field is pretty shallow, and it's a pretty good test, I thought. And uh, like I said, it's it works really well, really well. Alright guys, so in this clip I wanted to show you another powerful feature that the Sony cameras have. In this case it's focus peaking. And you can change the peaking level, uh, which is the power, you know, and it basically what it does is it recognizes high contrast areas. You can change the color also depending on what you're shooting. And notice how those red lines, see those red little lines showing up? That tells you that the high contrast areas are being found by the camera. So if you hit the C2 button by default, it'll zoom in for you when using a lens in manual focus mode. Alright guys, another killer feature I wanted to show you was the IAF autofocus. And it works amazingly well. So I just want to show you real quick how to set it up on the camera. Alright, so first off, the facial recognition has to be on. And you can see it on the screen there. So in the menu though, this is where it is. It's under number 7 on the camera. And you just got to go in there by pressing the center button on the dial. Make sure you have it on. And then you can see there's a square box that's telling you it recognizes the face. And it'll lock on green when you hit the shutter button, like it normally does for facial recognition. But if you press the center button there, look at that. That's IAF working. And it's locking on to what it believes is the closest eye to the camera. And it does an unbelievable good job. So this is just a quick test on a picture to show you how it works on the camera. Now let's check out the real world. All right, so now for a closer look, take a look at how sharp these are. And again, this is just with the 18 to 55 millimeter kit lens, and I was shooting raw, so the contrast isn't really that good. And he had a little gook in his eye there too. But more importantly, the sharpness. Look at this, just over and over. We're getting good shots. And um, it wasn't a 100% hit rate because he was moving around a lot, but uh, it was er very good accuracy overall. And um, I was very impressed, i got to be honest. It's so much better than the a7R, 
the original. So when you press the ISO button, it'll bring you into this area. And when you have it on auto ISO, you can actually set your minimum and maximum now. So when in when on auto, just uh, press the right directional on the pad here. See how I'm doing it? And then you can scroll left, right, up, down to change your minimum, maximum thresholds. Really great feature. I like that. But what I want to do now is test high ISO. All right, so here is ISO 102,400. And this is a raw file. So let me zoom in here. And you can see how much noise there is. Quite a bit. Quite a bit. But the detail is not that bad. I mean, 42 megapixel ISO 100,000. That's incredible. I mean, it's incredible. It's not as good as the A7S, but it's way better than the A7R. And this is JPEG. Let me show you JPEG just so you can see how much it cleans up. I mean, you can see the noise reduction is heavy, heavy. But still, not bad. I mean, in 42 mega, when you zoom out, it's like, oh, it's actually not that bad, almost usable. So 50,000 looks a lot better. It's actually 51,200. I'll zoom in here so you can see the difference in detail. Clearly, it's notably better. Now, this is the JPEG. Let me show you the RAW. And you can see the RAW has much more noise, but the detail retention is so much better than the 100,000. So this is definitely more, more usable than the 100,000, but it's nice to have that 100,000 when you need it. All right, so I just wanted to show you quick another feature that I like to use. It's called Auto HDR. And what it does is it takes multiple shots and it combines them on camera for you to give you a better result or a more dynamically range-filled result. So you can see here in the before and after, I did crop it a little bit, but the shadows have more information and the highlights also have more information. Here's another example. That's a regular just JPEG. You have to shoot in JPEG mode to do this, by the way. And then here is the auto HDR. I did add a vignette to this, um, so that's why you do see a heavy vignette added. That was me. But the exposure detail is what the auto HDR did. Another example, single frame, auto HDR. See all the different shadow detail. Another one, and you can see the sky. The blue sky comes in and the shadows. There's a few more. That's auto HDR. That's a regular JPEG. And um, so that's what it does in JPEG mode. Handheld, I was able to hold at one fifth of a second this shot, and you can see on the fence that it's sharp. So full frame, 42 megapixel sensor, and I got a sharp shot at one fifth of a second. So that's not bad. And that was the best I was able to do. Now with more practice and if I was more steady, secured better, I probably could have got a, you know, a lower shutter speed. But overall, I was pretty impressed with that. All right, so I got a request to show how I process this HDR photo. And it's extremely simple. So I'm just going to show you guys really quick how I did it. All I did was take five consecutive shots using the bracketing feature, which is very powerful. So I took five separate EVs of exposure. And what you got to do is select all these photos, and then you right-click on them. And what I do is I do export, and then I have this program that I purchased. It's called HDR Effects Pro 2. You just select that, and there it goes. The next thing you get presented with is this screen. Um, I usually just leave this at default and click Create HDR. By default, the image looks pretty good to me and looks pretty much how Photomatix renders, you know, using their default settings. But if you scroll over here to the preset library on the left, just scroll down a bit and take a look at these deep ones. Now they look really, really good in my opinion, and that's what I chose. So I believe I chose deep one, deep two, you can look at the highlight detail there. So I'm just going to click save. It's that simple guys, it's that simple. Alright, so here's the HDR file out of the uh, HDRFX Pro program. And here is the edited version that I originally showed you. So, if you go back to this one, you can simply hit the R key to crop, and then you can crop the angle that you want. I think I cropped it something like this, trying to get the line straight. Then you can uh, drag the clarity slider up a little bit, clarity here, vibrance, like so. Then if you go down to effects, I like to bring a little vignette in there, feather it, pretty much that's about it. So now if you see the edited one versus that one, it's pretty close. The color is a little bit different, so maybe if I go to the tone curve and do a medium, yeah, that punches up the blacks a little bit. So anyway, that's pretty much it for that, guys. I just wanted to show you that fast. And now let me show you a few other HDR examples 
using that same method. All right, so here's another shot of the waterfall using that same method. Here's another cool building, I thought. This one's over from the town of Goshen. Nice wide angle effect. The Basher Kill Wildlife Preserve. I took my Q500 drone down here the other day to get some aerial footage. So you can see these HDRs look awesome. It's actually very little editing work. I mean, the programs do all the work for you. I could add more drama to this with dodging and burning. I could manipulate the color to make it more warm, things like that. But overall, the results are incredible with such little effort. All right, guys, this is where things are going to really start to speed up here because I got to get through this review. Here's some real world photos. First time I really tried to shoot stars. I was pretty happy with the results. I really didn't know what I was doing. I just went for the uh, 30 seconds at F4 ISO 400. I was using one of my Canon lenses, focused at infinity, and it did a really good job. I thought, anyway, I mean, I'm not an expert in this. Uh, astrology type uh, photography but you know the results are pretty good the exposure of 30 seconds was obviously way too long when you zoom in you can see the uh, detail and you can see the movement you know so a faster lens would be a better option of course so me and my dad went to the Vanderbilt Museum I was using the Canon lens here again I was the thing was focusing so fast I did not even notice a difference between it and the native lens I mean it's a wide-angle you know, lens, so it's going to focus faster. Here's the raw file, and here is the edited file. I edited it using Color Effects Pro. It came out pretty good. Here's another shot. That's raw. That one's edited a little bit. So here's uh, looking into the room. This is ISO 6400, and here's an edited version. I just added a little bit of extra drama here. Let me just zoom in so you can see some of the detail. And that's pretty much what you got. It was handheld, 1 15th of a second. It has a very slight blur to it from my, uh, you know, hand movement, but overall the detail is very good, in my opinion. Here's another one I edited with a little more dreamy look to it. Another room here, and there's the edited version. This is ISO 5000. There's a unedited and edited ISO 10,000. Let me zoom in on this one. See, if... you know, ISO 10,000 is really good, and this is heavily edited. So I pushed the shadows, I pushed the detail to the max. And, you know, there's some noise there. I could have done a better job, but doing it real quick like that, very impressive. A couple more images. Really good dynamic range on this camera. Here's the edited version. Let me just show you the dynamic range real quick. If I go to basic up here, and let me just reset everything. If you just double click on the tone, it'll reset. But if I go to highlights and I drag this back, look at that. It just pulls the detail right back. And then if I go to shadows, drag them up, I mean, the information is there. That's dynamic range. So when I went to edit this file, I was able to get some kick-ass effects. Look at this. The um, Color Effects Pro program I was using pulled out all sorts of crazy detail. Looking up the spiral stairs is always fun. Played around with that for a couple minutes. Nice detail on the architecture. And they're doing some renovations on it. Nice depth of field there. And then one last shot shooting into the sun. All right, buddy, so here we are. I wanted to show you some sample photos using the Canon EF 24-105 lens. Me and my brother went to this ice cream place the other day, and on the way there, I took some photos. He was driving, so I actually took some photos while driving. And this shot, we were actually moving. He was pulling up to the intersection, and this Mercedes was coming by, so I did the old panning frame, and I was just happy with the results. The camera focused and took the shot much better than I was expecting. Uh, moving subject, it was doing about 30 miles an hour and we were also doing like 10. So whatever, I just wanted to show you that I was impressed that it was able to track and focus as well as it did. I mean, it didn't come out great or anything like that, but for what it was, I just was impressed, that's all. So then along the way, I saw a bunch of nice farm scenes and I was happy with the results. I mean, the, these are JPEGs straight off the camera and I was using a Canon lens, the 24 to 105, like I said, and the focus speed was fast enough and the accuracy was good enough that it almost worked as good as a native lens. Not quite, but very close. Now, look at this weird thing. We were driving again when I took this. We were doing about 10 miles an hour and I took this shot of the sign and it just created this cool effect. I guess the refraction of the light and these signs are somewhat translucent. Anyway, we get to the ice cream stand and this uh, this badass lotus was parked there. There's the JPEG and there's the raw file. So anyway, looking off in the, in the view, we had a nice view here from the creamery. And uh, here's another one. 
and it had some killer flavors. I ended up getting the Belleville Bog. It's called Belleville Farms Creamery. Shooting into the sun came out with a nice effect. By my brother's house, he has this cool black turt area where they do a lot of onion planting and stuff like that. There's always cool shots to be had, and these little cattail type weeds I thought looked pretty cool and created a nice subject, depth of field and whatnot. And here's a, a larger view so you can see what was behind what I was just shooting. And that's a JPEG file, and here is a RAW file. Took some pictures of Layla around the house, and I was impressed at the focus speed. It worked pretty good, facial recognition. The IAF does not work when using a Canon lens, but the face recognition does. And then the old, you know, holding the leaf and shooting it trick that we all do from every fall. <laughs> Another one of Layla on the swing. And it just takes a second to load. I'm sorry about that for it to crisp up. Here's another frame. And again, I just wanted to show you some separation. This is at 105 millimeter, and it just looks dreamy to me. Love the way that this renders. Love this lens. I wish uh, Sony would come out with a 24 to 105 for the um, E-mount, and I'm sure they're working on it because it's a st extremely high demand. This is a raw file. Bones Jones! And um, this one's actually a JPEG file. And it, this one came out a little better. It's really sharp. I'll zoom in and show you the detail. It's, it's really exceptional. I'm just going to keep moving along here. A couple of Jace, my little hand bone. I actually had skin smoothing on. I wanted to tell you, I forgot about that. I had skin smoothing on with these pictures. So when it senses a face, it does apply the smoothing. So you could see that the, it looks like I did some Photoshop work, but the camera did that. Another feature. All right, another thing I wanted to show you quick was in the lab, I just wanted to show you the resolving power of this 42 megapixel sensor. So here's a shot at f8 in the lab using a tripod. And I had my 24 to 105 lens mounted at 35 millimeter. And I just wanted to show you how sharp and how much detail is there. So you could see. 42 megapixel is unbelievable. You can see all the hairs, all the fibers on everything. The detail is absolutely exceptional. Same thing with the dollar bill. You got all sorts of crazy detail there. And I can go over to the circuit board, show you that. This lens is extremely high quality too, so you're going to get really good corner sharpness with this lens. And there's the Swiss Army knife. I found that the other day. Figured I would throw it into the lab scene. I don't really use it that much. So that's the resolving power, and it's really good, in my opinion. And this is the JPEG. I'll just zoom in so you can see the JPEG version. And you can see the yellows are jacked up a bit more, and the sharpness, contrast, and uh, all that is also accentuated here. So you can see more detail in the JPEG file as opposed to the RAW. The yellows are definitely jacked up a bit more. And here is one other shot I just took of the train so I could show you the separation you get at f4. So at f4, 105 millimeter, zoomed in on the train, you can get this killer separation with a full frame camera like the Sony a7R Mark II. All right, guys, so I also used the killer 70 to 200 f2.8L lens, and I took a couple of shots I wanted to show you. Here's one from the lab. And I just wanted to show you what kind of separation you can get. This is at 70 millimeter and f2.8. So I just focused here on the dollar bill area, and I wanted to show you how the train blurs out, how this uh, target here burns, blurs out, and also the lights. So it was an impressive rendering there, I thought. And then at 200 millimeter f2.8, you can get this real like butter effect. You could see here all the um, the little pipe cleaner things; they just butter right out into like this creamy mess. And that's what you get with a you know 200 millimeter f2.8 lens. You get that unbelievable narrow depth and separation. So and here's a shot out on the deck, just just showing you basic snapshots of what this lens can do on a full frame camera, really. That's all I was trying to illustrate here. I really didn't get anything that spectacular with this lens, um, except this shot I particularly liked of the sun. I took this out of focus a little bit, and it really created a nice 3D effect. You can see right here there's like a highlight um, you know, that just adds to the shape. It, it, it looks 3D, and I'd never got a shot this good of the sun before. And I'm thanking the lens, but also the Sony a7R II, because the sensor is incredible. 
and the, the detail it's able to capture and the dynamic range is just remarkable to me. So it's definitely noticeably better than my A7R on almost every level for me viewing it, you know, just looking at it like this. So I just wanted to note that the 70 to 200 millimeter did not work beyond 135 millimeter autofocus wise. It just did not track and it wasn't accurate. But there's an update for the Metabones 3 and Metabones 4 adapters and supposedly it works much better, but I still have not seen a good test done. Guys, so for the last phase of this review, come along with me to Space Farm Zoo and Museum. We went with the family here and I took some pictures. I want to show you what this thing can do in the real world, real environment. What I ended up using was the 55 to 210 millimeter lens. And I only took that lens because I wanted native fast autofocusing. And I also wanted the zoom range because we were going to a zoo. So I wanted to be able to zoom in and see stuff, you know, from a distance. So that lens worked perfect. Even though it's not full frame, it still did the job for me. And I got the shots I wanted. And I also was planning on taking video and I was going to use super 35 millimeter mode anyway. So it worked out well for that. This shot here I just wanted to show you is ISO 20,000. And you could see the detail is quite good, in my opinion, for 20,000. And this is real world stuff, guys. So low light. You know, this is what's going to happen when you go to a museum with your family and stuff. And this kit lens is slow. It's a 6.3, you know. So normally you really wouldn't be able to use a lens like this. But because the high ISO is so good, it's still somewhat usable. Here, this is 25,600. And again, this is a raw file, so it looks pretty dark. These are all raw files. But if I add some black like that, you know, you could punch it right up. And then I can drag the exposure up a little bit. And look at how much better that looks in just two seconds, you know? So even at ISO 25,000, these are usable images. I just wanted to show you how I can pull the highlight detail back uh, to, if you hold the Alt key down, it'll show you where it is. And you can pull it back, see all that? And get the highlight detail back on that bird where it was blown out. See how it looks all white? You can pull it right back. This place was cool because they had all these museum artifacts with old tools and locks and all sorts of stuff like that. I'm telling you, I was fascinated looking at this stuff. Had old lanterns, all different kinds of nails, things like that. Um, pulleys, I mean, you name it. it. It was a lot of fun. Oh, I was shooting through a fence. I wanted to show you how this came out. You could see the fence right here on the left side. See that? That's part of the chain link fence. It's actually going right through this bird's beak. But you could still get a pretty cool shot. I mean, this is a decent shot. I, the thing was bobbing around, you know, and what I liked was his eye. His eye caught my attention, the color. So I was like, ah, let me give it a shot. So look how good this came out, shooting through a fence with a kit lens at, uh, you know, it was actually at 55 millimeter and just pointing and shooting, you know. Very good, in my opinion. This was the blacksmith den. It was unbelievably cool. He had all sorts of the uh, clamp tools, you know, for grabbing metal. Apparently this was an original jail. This was pretty cool. They had some old school bicycles with a big wheel in the front like they used to have back in the day. These little early tricycles and stuff like that. But you can see the dynamic range here in the corner and stuff. The, the camera's exposing really well and it's doing a good job in my opinion for this point and shoot type exercise that I'm doing here. They also had some really cool old school tractors. A lot of fun. Check out this drive. This gear drive system, I've never seen this type of gear drive mechanism before. You see how that is? I'm not exactly sure what that's called, but it's it's like the opposite of what is normally the case. I thought that was kind of interesting. Anyway, check out this cool John Deere, old school John Deere tractor. And this thing was pretty sweet looking. It was unbelievably complicated, the steering mechanism and whatnot. And there was a llama. This guy was cute. We were feeding him. He had these little, like, mushy lips. He was eating the corn and stuff out of our hand. He, he was really cute. Um, check out this shot of Jace I took. It's just a raw file. It looks pretty crappy because of the exposure and stuff. But in Lightroom, you can easily correct these things. Take a look. In about five minutes, I did that. From this to that, and now it looks like almost like a portrait, you know? So the versatility of these raw files is incredible. I was able to pull back all that detail, brighten the face and all that, and, and the results are very good, in my opinion. I mean, exceptionally good. Now check this cat out. He likes to hang out with the raccoons. I thought that was kind of crazy, but it's actually a raccoon breed type cat, and he thinks he's a raccoon, apparently. <laughs> the raccoons don't mind, so what am I to say? There's some cute deer, another one. And they had some lions there. It's unfortunate to see them in the cage like this, but uh, they were beautiful for sure. And the detail came out pretty damn good, in my opinion. 
considering it's a kit lens. And they also had in the museum had some old cameras. I just took a picture or two. And then I saw that they had this uh, Voigtlander lens on this old school one. And they just came out with some new lenses. Check out this baby carriage. This thing is an unbelievable stroller, rather, like a baby stroller. I was quite impressed by this thing. Okay guys, so in closing, I just wanted to tell you that the new Sony a7R Mark II is totally worth the investment if you're in the market. It's the best all-in-one full-frame mirrorless camera available today. It's extremely powerful. It's far better than the previous model, and Sony addressed a lot of the issues that were, you know, plaguing it, like that nasty clunky shutter. Uh, not the best ergonomics and whatnot. They addressed all those issues. They also added the killer new hybrid AF sensor, and it works. It, it holds up to the hype. The Super 35 millimeter mode really brings video to the next level, and um, that's a very welcomed feature, and it makes the camera much more powerful than it was previously. Now, it is expensive. 3198 US is a lot of money. But when you look at the features and the quality that you actually get, it's not really that much money. I mean, you, the, the stuff that this camera can do literally years ago was so much more money, it's insane. So you have to factor that stuff in. Battery life, you know, of course, battery life could be improved. It's not very good at all. But they do give you two batteries in the box and a good charger. The battery door still doesn't lock. You still have to close it and actually slide the lever over. Um, the memory card door used to accidentally open on the A7R. That no longer happens. They uh, lowered the profile of that door and it doesn't open anymore. And uh, guys, that's pretty much it. I mean, please feel free to ask questions and comment below if you have more. I tried to cover everything without being too redundant. As far as you know there's a lot of quality reviews on the web and I didn't want to just repeat what other reviewers already did so I tried to go about it in a little bit of different way this time but by all means if you have any questions I missed or things I didn't cover just ask below and of course support links are below as well which I greatly appreciate all right take care be good peace <laughs>